Um, so we're really happy to have Nathaniel, um, Greg, uh, to give the theory colloquium. Um, he is, as you know, he's a professor in um, UC Santa Barbara. Um, I know him since I think he was grad student or know of his papers. I haven't personally met him. Um, and uh, somewhere around uh, 2008, 2009, uh, we were, um, uh, I mean, we wrote a wonderful paper about uh, some version of supersymmetric theories in which conformal field theory finds, you know, um, a fixed point where uh, the, you know, it creates, um, in the fixed point, it creates a hierarchy between the scalars and fermions that was supposed to solve some of the issues in supersymmetry. And we learned that these two students from Stanford are working to say like, this makes no sense. Okay, and they wrote the paper, it's a wonderful paper uh, and, uh, and saying that how it actually doesn't work. Uh, we, I mean, some, and that's how I came to know of uh, Nate Klein. The paper was beautiful, even if you go back right now, you could probably read it. Um, fortunately, he corrected sometime back, five, six years later or something. Uh, so to make it again viable, but that's the first time I learned about him. Uh, in between, he went from Stanford to um, to Princeton, and from Princeton to Rutgers, right? And then joined Santa Barbara. Is that right, Nick? Yeah, yeah. I was I was at Rutgers and, and the institute at the same time. Um, so the, that's his story. And um, if you, you you must know uh, him specifically in the community of model builders and phenomenologists, and he became essentially famous after his talks about uh, lectures about naturalness and uh, various different ways uh, you to think of naturalness. I recommend all the grad students present here. That's a wonderful read. And uh, even for uh, seniors, uh, faculties, because naturalness is a topic which is uh, probably talked about all the time, uh, very less understood and uh, very badly presented almost everywhere. <laughs> so in, in any case, so he works from all the way from the collider physics to model building to aspects of cosmology. Uh, he's a wonderful speaker and I hope you'll enjoy his talk. Uh, well, thanks a thank, lot thank you. for giving the talk. Sure. Thanks very much. Thank you for that incredibly generous introduction. I should say, of course, you know, I, I remember meeting to him uh, when he came to Slack as I was a graduate student, indeed, to give a talk on this work that he was doing on sort of using conformal field theory and, and supersymmetry and, and sort of being blown away because there were very few things those days that were new and surprising in model building. And that was something new and surprising. So um, anyway, it was a great, great pleasure back then and, and a great pleasure to be back now. Uh, my only regret in being here today is, is to not actually be, be here in person. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to give a talk, but I also look forward in the future to, uh, to coming and visiting. Um, so my topic today is, is the once and future Higgs, uh, and I will try to elaborate on what exactly that means uh, as we go through it. Um, my, you know, as a particle theorist, uh, of course, the natural language of particle theory is quantum field theory. And um, I, I imagine many of you are familiar with quantum field theory, but I would also like for those of you who are not uh, to give just some accessible waypoints um, that would guide the way to think about uh, what's going on. And so, you know, again, if you're a field theorist, uh, hopefully you'll just find this a warm and comfortable way to think about what's going on. And if you're not a field theorist, hopefully this will help you uh, to get a mental picture. But uh, there's sort of three important things that we get from quantum field theory that help guide how we think about uh, the physics of the Higgs and the standard model in general. And so I wanna lay those out before progressing into the Higgs itself, uh, where we are and, and where we're going. Um, and so the first piece that's very useful uh, to orient yourself around is this idea that particle physics is really alchemy. And that's something that's given to us uh, by the relativistic part of quantum field theory. The basic idea is just that, uh, you know, as particle physicists, of course, we're used to drawing physical processes as cartoons, as Feynman diagrams in space and time. And uh, so here, of course, on the left is just some process by which some charged particle scatters off of some other charged particle by exchanging a photon. And the sense in which particle physics is alchemy is that uh, you know, relativity, of course, tells you in some sense that the space and time directions in some well-defined way are interchangeable. And so that if the scattering process exists, then there's also a process where you sort of tilt the axes on their side. And instead you can take a particle and an antiparticle, smash them together and through a photon, 
turn them into a new particle and its antiparticle. And the existence of this latter production mechanism, turning one thing into another, is implied by relativity from the existence of scattering. And so that's a sense in which particle physics is alchemy. You can take things and make entirely new things. And the only thing that's required to do that uh, is energy. The second piece that's very critical you know, in quantum field theory to understand what's going on, uh, in addition to this alchemical nature of relativity is the quantum mechanical vacuum, right? So classically in a theory where H bar is equal to zero, the vacuum is nothing. It is the tabula rasa on which the theory is built. But the quantum mechanics of the theory tells you that actually the vacuum is a very rich and interesting place. It's filled with all sorts of vacuum processes, particles and antiparticles, you know, bubbling in and out of existence. And that gives the vacuum a very interesting structure. Uh, and it's a structure that actually has an impact on physical observables that you can go ahead and see the effects of the quantum vacuum uh, when you measure, for example, scattering between particles as a function of scale. So this, this quantum mechanical vacuum, it's in some sense a very real thing, and it imbues uh, the theory with properties that are very different from the classical theory where h bar is equal to zero. And then the third piece that's just important uh, to orient yourself around if you're not a quantum field theorist is the idea that uh, the thing itself uh, in a relativistic theory of quantum mechanics are the fields. Uh, these are the objects that suffuse space and time, uh, and their excitations are what we come to think of as particles. So in what follows, of course, I'll often go back and forth between talking about fields and particles, but you should just think that the fields are the things themselves, and the particles are their sort of instantiations or excitations. So uh, if, if you don't have a background in quantum field theory, these three pieces are really, I think, all you need to understand what's interesting uh, in the physics of the standard model, uh, particularly with respect to the Higgs. So we sort of used these different three pieces of quantum field theory in particle physics over the course of the last um, 60 years or so uh, to actually assemble the, the modern standard model as we know it. And the basic strategy has been, of course, to construct a, a set of increasingly energetic colliders uh, to take advantage of the sort of alchemy prop property of quantum field theory, the fact that as long as you have more and more energy, you can make uh, more and more massive particles by colliding the things uh, together that you have. But that's not the only way that we've actually been able to uh, assemble the understanding of the fundamental uh, uh, physics of the standard model. It, we don't just have to make new particles by colliding with sufficient energy, but we can also infer the existence of new particles by probing the structure of their effects on the vacuum. And so this plot here, this is a sort of a Livingston plot uh, you know, of time and the particle energy. And I've shown sort of two different classes of accelerator uh, um, uh, accelerators or colliders here. Uh, the blue dots correspond to electron-positron colliders, uh, things like the sphere, uh, the SLC and LEP colliders, um, and the orange squares correspond to hadron machines, so proton-proton or proton-antiproton machines. And of course, you'll notice, right, there's sort of two broadly different uh, energy scales associated with these two different classes of accelerator complexes, and that just has to do uh, of course, with the, the energy losses of accelerating electrons and positrons versus protons and antiprotons. But what you see is in these two parallel sets of colliders over time, uh, we've been able to discover a whole host of particles, either by just producing them directly, uh, as we have at the hadron machines, uh, also producing them directly at electron-positron machines, but even at the electron-positron machines like LEP uh, and LEP2, where we didn't necessarily produce new degrees of freedom, we were able to sort of probe the quantum mechanical structure of the vacuum with enough precision and fidelity to infer the existence of particles that we could then go discover at hadron machines. And so we've been pursuing this program of you know, building increasingly more energetic colliders um, you know, over the course of the last 60 years. And that continues through to this day to the LHC uh, and in principle on into the future as we think about colliders that might be successors to the LHC. Um, so, of course, the LHC itself needs no real introduction, uh, you know, apart from these, these beautiful illustrations uh, of, of the 27 kilometer ring under the Swiss French border uh, and the number of uh, detectors around instrumented around the collision points. Uh, of course, the two most famous are the ATLAS and CMS, the general purpose detectors, but there's a whole host of interesting specialized detectors as well that are measuring aspects of proton proton and heavy ion collisions at the LHC. And the end point of this whole process of building these increasingly uh, more powerful accelerators and, and detector complexes around them has been the assembly of what we now know of as the standard model. And so, you know, it's, it's something that is uh, on one hand, incredibly complicated and interesting and, and uh, full of rich uh, field theory, uh, but also is something simple enough that you can put on a t-shirt. 
And so uh, this, of course, is the t-shirt version of the standard model. Um, and just if you looked at the t-shirt version of the standard model, what it would look like is just an enumeration of the fundamental particles that we've discovered. But what makes the standard model so interesting is not just its enumeration of the particles we've discovered, but actually the very intricate and deep relations between them. The other thing that you get just by looking at the t-shirt version of the standard model is that at the very center of everything is the Higgs boson. And that's not just a, you know, a, a nice feature of this illustration, but it really hints at the sort of essential role that the Higgs boson plays at the heart of the standard model. So the thing that makes the standard model so interesting, the thing that makes it much more than just an enumeration of the particles that we've seen um, is actually the, the structure of the interactions uh, between the particles themselves. And so, you know, if you, you look at this list of particles in the standard model, they're all very different. They all seem to have very different properties. Uh, but when you stare at them long enough, you notice there's something very remarkable about them, which is that if you take particular linear combinations of the, the weak vector bosons in the theory, the W bosons, the Z bosons, and the photon, these are all very different seeming vector bosons. They have different masses, different individual couplings. But if you take specific linear combinations of them, they all couple to the other particles of the standard model in the same way. And that, of course, is a harbinger of an underlying structure of a symmetry, uh, namely the electric symmetry, unification of electromagnetism and the weak forces. So if, as a theorist, of course, you make this observation that, that there are uh, sets of or co linear combinations of the electric gauge bosons of the standard model that reflect an underlying symmetry. And of course, as a theorist, you get very excited because symmetries are very predictive. So if you give this observation to a theorist, you know, you imagine giving this observation to a theorist, theorists would get very excited and say, well, that's great. Uh, if you've given me the field content or the particle content of the standard model, and this observation that there is an underlying unification of the electroweak interactions, I have a perfect prediction for the mass spectrum of the theory. And that perfect prediction of the mass spectrum of the theory is that everything should be massless because the underlying symmetry structure uh, and the quantum numbers of the particles in the standard model would simply tell you that there's no way to give masses to any of these particles. Okay, so it's a great theorist's prediction. And so now the theorist takes it to their friend the experimentalist and says, I have this amazing prediction. Let's go confirm it in nature. And the experimentalist goes in this series of colliders, measures the properties of all of these particles uh, and comes back and says, unfortunately, right, um, you know, reality has a very different structure from the one that you've predicted that instead of, of all the particles being massless, as you predict by the symmetry structure, instead there's actually a very rich texture of masses and, and very interesting patterns. And um, there's a lot of very interesting physics. Uh, of course, the patterns themselves are very suggestive of some underlying structure, uh, the generational structure of the standard model, which remains mysterious to this day. But even apart from that generational structure, just the fact that you know, there is a very sharp theory prediction given electric symmetry and the particle content of the standard model that everything should be massless. But of course, in nature, we see instead a very interesting set of different masses. And so at the heart of the standard model is really a tension between the symmetry structure, uh, which predicts that everything should be massless, and what we see in nature where things have a rich and, and sort of dazzling array of masses. So the resolution of this tension, of course, is the Higgs itself. And that's why the Higgs plays such a central role in the standard model. And the essential uh, observation uh, that reconciles this tension between the symmetry predictions of the standard model and the observation of the mass spectrum is that it's possible for the vacuum uh, of the theory not to respect the underlying symmetry of the interactions. And, and so this is essentially what the Higgs field carries out, the role that it plays in the standard model which is that the underlying theory is indeed symmetric, as you predict from these, the structure of the electroweak interactions. But the Higgs field, as the only scalar degree of freedom in the theory, has a potential uh, that puts its minimum away from its origin in field space, and that gives it a, a background value everywhere in space. And that background value breaks the underlying symmetry of the interactions. And then the interactions of particles in the standard model with that background condensate uh, imbue them with masses. And so this allows you to reconcile precisely the um, prediction of the symmetry structure of the theory with the observation of the masses. And in this picture, uh, the more strongly a particle in the standard model interacts with the Higgs, the more strongly it interacts with this vacuum condensate of the Higgs, the more massive it becomes. And so there's a very tight prediction um, in this hypothesis between the mass of a particle in the standard model and the strength with which it couples to the Higgs. And this is a prediction which of course we can then go and look for at colliders. 
So we followed this sort of logical strategy of, of discovering the various pieces of the standard model, uh, observing the underlying symmetry structure of the standard model, but also the tension between that symmetry structure and the mass spectrum of the particles. And that pointed to the existence of a Higgs field and its excitation in the Higgs boson. And so there followed, of course, a sort of 50 year physics program of looking for evidence of the Higgs boson at a succession of more and more energetic colliders. And that physics program culminated right in 2012 uh, with the discovery of the Higgs at the LHC. Um, so here, hopefully this, this animated GIF will play for you. This is just a nice illustration by the Atlas collaboration uh, of looking for events where a Higgs boson is produced and decays into a pair of Z bosons. The Z bosons decay into leptons uh, which allow you to reconstruct the kinematics of the final state very precisely. And what you see, you know, as they gather data in 2011 and 2012, of course, there are many events uh, that line up with standard model background predictions. But then, of course, there was an excess uh, of events around 125 GeV, which could be explained uh, by the production of these four lepton events through a Higgs boson. And so this, uh, this channel, along with a few other channels at both the Atlas and CMS, uh, integrated over the first two years of the LHC's operation were enough to provide compelling evidence for the existence of the Higgs and led to, of course, a lot of uh, very hyperbolic sounding uh, newspaper headlines like this one in the New York Times, that physicists find elusive particles seen as key to universe. Um, but part of the point of the rest of this talk is to really give substance uh, to this idea that the Higgs, you know, it's not just another piece of the standard model, but it is, as Dennis Overby says in this newspaper article, uh, a particle that is, is a key in some sense to the underlying structure of the universe. So that was up to 2012. Uh, that was the uh, led us to the discovery of the Higgs, which was a great triumph. And so really the question is, and the, the animating purpose of this talk is to answer, well, then, then what? Um, and there's really two pieces to that question. So one piece is, you know, the discovery was in 2012. We are now in the first few months of 2021. So nine years have elapsed since the discovery of the Higgs. So what's happened in that time? Has this remained interesting as a physics question? Have we learned anything that's qualitatively new? But the other piece uh, worth paying attention to is looking forward from now into the future. So this is now a slightly out of date timeline for the LHC. Everything has been shifted about a year later because of COVID. But um, apart from the nine years between the Higgs discovery and now, there's then a sort of 17 or 18 year physics program from now until the end of the HLLHC, culminating in what's known as the high luminosity LHC. And so in some sense, we have much more ahead of us at the LHC uh, than we have behind us. And so the question is, you know, what is that time? What is the next 18 years of physics at the LHC going to tell us about the Higgs? And what are we going to learn that's interesting? So um, my goal in the rest of this talk is to answer both of those questions. What are some of the things that we've learned since the discovery of the Higgs up until now? And really, what are the things that we stand to learn from now looking to the future to the end of the LHC, but also as we look beyond the LHC, what the questions are that really animate continuing to pursue this direction in fundamental physics? All right, so to start with, what are some of the things that we've learned uh, since the discovery of the Higgs itself? Well, um, of course, in the early days, uh, all we had was uh, some excess events over the standard model backgrounds. These have since refined themselves into a number of very precise measurements that have allowed us to pin down the underlying properties of the Higgs to great precision. Um, some of the more notable things are we've made you know, very precise measurements now of the mass of the Higgs by looking in various channels with the best experimental resolution. We've been able to establish that the Higgs is indeed a, a spin zero and is a, a scalar particle. Uh, as predicted by the standard model. And in particular, uh, we've, we've learned from that that at least as far as we're able to tell, uh, it's, it's even under charge and parity transformations, again, as the standard model predicts. We've also been able to measure uh, with increasing precision uh, the couplings of the Higgs to particles of the standard model. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the hypothesis that the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs is what is responsible for reconciling the tension between the symmetry structure of the standard model and the mass spectrum of the standard model. That means there's a very tight connection between the mass of a particle in the standard model and its coupling to the Higgs. And that's borne out by this nice plot here on the right, which is just plotting the appropriate scaling of the Higgs coupling to the heavier particles in the standard model uh, relative to their mass. And so, of course, in the standard model hypothesis, all of the particles in the standard model should lie along this dashed yellow line. And to the best that we've been able to determine, in fact, they do, 
which is a nice verification of the idea that the Higgs is in fact the origin of mass in the standard model. More broadly, we've been able to measure the couplings of the Higgs to standard model particles through the strength of both its production and decay. And with uh, the exception of some modest deviations, generally speaking, those agree with standard model predictions to about the 10 or 20% level. And uh, this is you know, impressive validation of the predictions of the standard model. It's also remarkable considering that you know, when the LHC was first proposed back in the 80s, it was thought to be impossible to discover Higgs at all at any mass, much less to measure its couplings to within the 10 or 20% level. There's also a couple of things. So these are things that we've learned in the sort of nine years since the Higgs discovery that you would have expected to be able to learn uh, at the time that we were looking for the Higgs. We've also learned a number of things that uh, you might not have expected, or at least nobody expected was possible at the time that the Higgs was discovered. And one of the things that we've been able to learn um, is actually about measurements of the width of the Higgs itself. Now, the reason this is a surprising thing that we've learned since the Higgs discovery is there was some very well appreciated lore uh, that the Higgs width, uh, which is inversely proportional to its lifetime, is an unmeasurable quantity at a hadron collider like the LHC. And the reason for this lore is that um, if you make a real physical Higgs boson from some standard model initial state and you let it decay into some standard model final state, the rate for that production uh, goes like the, the square of the couplings of the Higgs to the initial state times the square of its couplings to the final state divided by its width. Um, and unfortunately, that combination, the thing that you measure is the rate, that combination is invariant under a simultaneous rescaling of both the width and the couplings. So you could always imagine deviations from the standard model that would modify the numerator and denominator in the same way and prevent you from extracting any direct information about the width by making rate measurements. But a re really remarkable observation that was made right around the time of the discovery of the Higgs is that uh, this is certainly true if you make real Higgses uh, and watch them decay, but there are also uh, contributions from Higgs bosons to various final states where you've only produced a virtual Higgs, you haven't made it on its mass shell. And the contribution of a virtual Higgs to various final states scales independently of the width. So if you're able to measure some final state and get both the contributions from the Higgs, a real Higgs that's made on shell and a virtual Higgs that's made off shell, the ratio of those two weights, of course, allows you to extract the width directly. And so this is something that uh, both collaborations have been doing with great effect. Uh, since the Higgs discovery uh, and getting to the point where we're, we're within a factor of few measurement of the Higgs width uh, from these sorts of observations. And as we play this forward through the remainder of the high luminosity LHC, we should be able to get uh, within about a 25% measurement of the width of the Higgs, which is remarkable considering that uh, up until the Higgs was discovered, we thought this would be impossible at a hadron collider like the LHC. Something else that we've learned uh, that's somewhat surprising, you know, since the discovery of the Higgs is actually just how to think of the appropriate theory framework for describing the Higgs boson and any possible deviations from the standard model. So of course, in the standard model, all of the properties of the Higgs boson are somewhat uniquely predicted. Um, and so if you actually measured a deviation from the standard model predictions, you need some sort of theory framework in which to, to frame that deviation. So the most natural way to do that is in the language of what we call effective field theory, which is to imagine that the standard model as we know it, that consists of a quantum field theory that has the fields of the standard model, and it has all of the interactions uh, that become important as we go to low energies. We call those the renormalizable uh, interactions uh, of these fields. But it's possible to take that theory and augment it by adding additional operators, products of the fields in the standard model, that we call irrelevant. That is to say, they become unimportant as we go to low energies, but as we go to higher and higher energies, they become increasingly important. And in fact, at some point they tell us there's a scale at which the standard model fields must be augmented with new degrees of freedom. So these sorts of effective field theories, of course, they exist uh, all throughout physics, uh, whether or not they're couched in the language of quantum field theory. But what's impressive, or at least surprising, is that in the standard model, we actually only systematically enumerated the sort of lowest lying effective field theory extensions of the standard model uh, within about two years before the Higgs discovery. And it's only been since the discovery of the Higgs that we've actually begun to truly systematically enumerate the entire uh, structure of these effective field theories. So what I'm actually showing you here is a sort of graphic illustrating the number of different operators as a function of operator dimension uh, in the standard model effective field theory. 
Uh, this was actually something that was done uh, using uh, Hilbert series techniques about three years after the discovery of the Higgs. And it's just an illustration of the fact that it's only been after the discovery of the Higgs that we've come to fully understand what the appropriate field theory description is uh, for deviations from standard model predictions. And the exploration of these field theories is a very interesting and ongoing endeavor. So that somewhat, in certain sense, brings us up to the present day. Okay, we've discovered the Higgs, we've begun to learn very interesting things about it. So far, these seems to be in good agreement with the predictions of the standard model. But for all of this excitement of discovery, there's a tremendous amount that we, we still have to learn. I think the central question in some sense is, is it the Higgs of the standard model? But I find, you know, thinking about the Higgs and, and what we can learn from it, asking is it the standard model Higgs is, is sort of a practically, or is, it's, 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 it's really an impractical question. Um, because of course, you can always measure experimentally with greater and greater precision, and you could confirm that those measurements are in better and better agreement with the standard model. But you don't learn from that at what point you've gained something qualitative. So as we think about what we can learn from the Higgs looking into the future, it's more useful to think about some major conceptual questions. And as I'll try to argue, these conceptual questions, they're very deep, they're very interesting. And uh, whatever the answer is to the questions, uh, we will learn something very, very new. All right. So some of these questions are things like, uh, is the Higgs elementary or is it composite? Does it interact with itself? Does it mediate a Yukawa force? Uh, how and why is electric symmetry broken? And although it might sound hyperbolic, what is ultimately the fate of the universe? So let's just go through these questions in turn, and, and I'll try to convince you why they're interesting and what we can hope to learn by, by attempting to answer them. So the first question was, you know, is the Higgs that we've discovered, is it a fundamental scalar uh, or is it somehow a composite? And of course, in the standard model, the prediction is that the Higgs boson is a fundamental scalar. Now, the observation of a scalar itself is not that exciting because even before we discovered the Higgs, we had already seen scalars in nature. In particular, we'd seen them in the form of the bound states uh, of QCD, you know, in the, the broad spectrum of mesons. And if you think about all of the, the bound states that we get from QCD, there's sort of an interesting question you can ask, which is, well, how composite are they? And it turns out they're not all created equal. Um, so what does it even mean to ask, you know, how composite is, is some particular meson? Well, you can make the following comparison, okay? So any meson in the standard model, whether it be the charge and neutral pions or the eta, uh, it has some radius associated with it, uh, which is actually associated, you know, it really has a, a size associated with its interactions. Um, but it also has a length scale, it's Compton wavelength, which is, you know, the, the um, wavelength of uh, light that you would get if you converted all of the mass of the particle uh, into light. And you can then compare the actual physical size of a meson to its constant wavelength. And when those two scales coincide, those are sort of maximally composite particles. Uh, whereas if they're very different, that points to composite particles that are in some sense more elementary. Okay. So if you just look at this in the context of the strong interactions, something like the eta, uh, its Compton wavelength is uh, on the same order as its scale set by its form factors. And so it's a very composite particle. But if you look like, at, for example, the neutral pion, uh, there's its length scale of its form factor, which is set by the row mass, that actually is very different by a factor of about six uh, from the Compton wavelength of the pion itself. And that, of course, that difference that tells us that the pion is special. It's in fact a, a pseudo Goldstone boson uh, and in some sense is less composite than its compatriots. So you can play the story forward with the Higgs um, and you can ask, well, is the Higgs elementary composite or more precisely, you know, is it the most elementary scalar we've seen or is it something that is much like uh, some of the mesons of QCD? And so, as I noted, you know, in the standard model, the Higgs boson is an elementary particle. So, of course, it is predicted uh, in the standard model. Yeah. Uh, uh, one question, clarification from your last slide. Yeah. Um, in uh, if you had, uh, uh, so first of all, eta is a PNGB as well, right? I mean, if, yes, but but yeah, not yeah. as much of a PNGB, right, as the pion. So it is it is a more it is a more composite. Uh, you may just because the S mass is slightly bigger. I mean, that's the only reason why the Compton. Yes, yes. So, so it, it, indeed, the, the real point is there are varying degrees of compositeness. Right. So of course, can, the, thing, the thing whose Compton wavelength is the same size as its form factor is the rho. So I haven't shown that here. Uh, but then within the spectrum of lighter mesons, you know, there is a difference in this ratio 
between the, the say, the ADA and the PI on. Okay, uh, let me ask in a slightly different manner. In, in the limit, MUMT goes to zero, right? PI becomes massless. Are you going to call it not composite particle? Um, no, that's, I think here, here you are, uh, that is a technically correct point. Uh, indeed, it still has a finite uh, form factor, um, even though its Compton wavelength uh, diverges. Uh, but uh, okay, that's a that's a. I, I don't think this undermines the logic of of using the ratio of the form factor of the Compton wavelength as a relative measure of the compositeness of the degree of freedom. Okay. Yeah. I mean, to put it a different way, if you would like to ask the question of how composite is some scalar degree of freedom, you know, I would encourage you to propose another figure of merit, but these are the two natural scales that you have. And it is very useful to compare them to each other. So in particular, it's just useful to ask this question with respect to the Higgs itself. And this is interesting for many reasons, right? Um, to the extent that, of course, you can never confirm with absolute fidelity if a particle is elementary, you would at least like to know, is it the most elementary particle or most elementary scalar we've ever seen? So as I was saying, in the standard model, of course, uh, you don't predict that the Higgs, the Higgs is indeed a point-like object that doesn't have any form factor. And so what this really means in the context of the standard model um, is that anything that looks like a form factor of the Higgs would show up in the form of these irrelevant operators that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, so some of the irrelevant operators that you can imagine adding to the standard model have the form of being sort of size corrections that indeed look like form factors uh, like the ones you would associate with the, with the different mesons of QCD. And so uh, these different size corrections, they have uh, impacts on properties of the Higgs. And so we can go ahead and we can look for them in making precision measurements of the standard model production and decay rates of the Higgs. So, so far to the extent that everything we've measured is in reasonable agreement with the standard model, all we've learned is a sort of bound uh, on the size corrections to the Higgs. Um, the bound that we have from current LHC data doesn't tell us that the Higgs is any more or less composite than the pions. Uh, in fact, it more or less only tells us that the difference between the Compton wavelength of the Higgs and the possible size of its form factors is about a factor of four. But as we continue to play this physics program forward at the LHC, as we measure the Higgs with more and more fidelity, we're able to either discover or replace better and better bounds in these size corrections. And so by the end of the LHC, we will either know that in fact, the Higgs is by far the most elementary scalar degree of freedom we've seen because its form factor will be some, so much smaller than necessarily its Compton wavelength, or we'll discover some evidence uh, for this form factors that will tell us that the Higgs has a size. And then of course, instead of being an elementary scalar as the standard model predicts, it will be a composite degree of freedom uh, with a whole host of new, new physics, much as the, the host of physics associated with the compositeness of the pions in QCD. Um, so this is a situation where the measurements that we make to understand if the Higgs is elementary or composite, whatever the outcome is, either if it's agreement with the standard model, uh, then we'll discover that we've seen the most elementary scalar uh, in nature. Uh, or if we find some deviation from the standard model, evidence that the Higgs is composite, then that will point to an abundance of new physics around the corner. So this is a sort of set of measurements of Higgs properties where whatever the answer is, uh, whether it's agreement with a standard model or deviation from it, we'll have learned something qualitatively new. Nathaniel, there, there is a question. question. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. Uh, on this issue of compositeness, uh, is it possible that the Higgs is a composite of the standard model fermions already known to us? Or is that ruled out or could it be tested? Um, so I, I don't think there is there is no, um, in the standard model itself with no additional degrees of freedom, uh, there is no mechanism by which you would form a scalar bound state with the properties of the Higgs that we've seen at 125 GB. So in particular, it's not possible for it to be a bound state of the strong interactions. Um, the weak interactions in electromagnetism don't have the right properties at the scale to create bound states. Um, so if your ground rules are to simply take the standard model itself uh, and ask if with the existing interactions in particle spectrum, you can create something that looks like the Higgs, the answer is, is no. Um, oh, you could please. imagine, sorry? Oh, go ahead, please go ahead, please go ahead. 
yeah, I mean, I, I, it, I, it depends a little bit on how you want to define making it a bound state of the standard model. It is possible to come up with uh, extensions of the standard model in which in the top sector, there is some physics that makes a bound state that looks like the Higgs, but I would call that something that requires an extension of the standard model. Okay, thank you, thank you. So a related question where the answer is interesting no matter what happens uh, is, is asking whether the, the Higgs interacts with itself. So of course, in the standard model, uh, we predict that the Higgs indeed interacts with itself and that self interaction is very sharply fixed in terms of the value of the weak scale and the mass of the Higgs boson. But nonetheless, so you might say if we confirm that the Higgs interacts with itself, that will just be a validation of the standard model and maybe that's not anything very exciting. But I would like to argue that, you know, if we actually observe that the Higgs interacts with itself in agreement with the standard model, that would be evidence for a new phenomenon that we have yet to see in nature in any form. And the rationale behind that is, although we have many different types of interactions in the standard model, all of the other interactions in the standard model change the internal quantum numbers of the particles that interact. That's true uh, for the electroweak interactions. Uh, that's true even for the strong interactions. For example, when gluons interact with each other, they change color. Um, and so if we indeed saw an interaction of the Higgs boson with itself, um, that's something that doesn't change any internal quantum numbers. And that would be unlike anything ever before seen in nature. On the other hand, if we see a deviation from the standard model prediction for the Higgs self interaction, that would also point to the existence of new physics beyond the standard model. And so this is a situation where whatever the answer turns out to be, uh, if we can measure evidence for the Higgs self interactions, uh, we will have learned something profoundly new about nature. This actually turns out, I should, here I just want to make a brief aside, the way that you would do this at the LHC really points to the sort of rich interconnectedness uh, of physics in the standard model uh, and in physics and quantum field theory in general. So very naively, if, if you sat down and said, well, I would like to understand, I'd like to make measurements uh, at the LHC of the self-coupling of the Higgs, um, the first thing you'd think about doing is, uh, is looking for processes of the form I've illustrated up here, where maybe you bring two gluons together from the protons, you make a Higgs boson, and that Higgs boson in its coupling to two other Higgses produces two Higgses in the final state. So this is the sort of conventional way that you might look to probe the Higgs self interaction uh, by producing a Higgs and using it to make other Higgses through its self interaction. But it turns out to probe the, the self couplings of the Higgs, you don't necessarily need to produce final states with two Higgs bosons in them. So the very same Higgs self interactions also give rise to processes like the ones I've illustrated down here on the bottom right where, for example, you can uh, scatter quarks off of each other by emitting electric bosons, and those electric bosons can in turn radiate Higgses, and those Higgses can fuse to make a single Higgs boson. And that process is sensitive to the exact same self-coupling as the production of two Higgses, uh, but it only involves one Higgs in the final state. And moreover, that particular process, due to its underlying nature, uh, that will grow in importance uh, with higher and higher collisional energies, particularly if there's a deviation from the standard model. So the only reason I mention this is in fact, there's a very rich and elaborate program uh, of how you can possibly get the Higgs self interactions, which don't just involve the natural measurements you might have believed would be the simple ways to get the Higgs self coupling. But in fact, there's a whole host of other measurements you can make, some of which don't even involve Higgs in the final state at all, which provide sensitivity to the same underlying physics. Uh, and this is something that I think has only been really understood or appreciated again in the context of the last few years. So currently we don't have a particularly, we certainly haven't measured or found evidence for self interactions of the Higgs. But if you again play these sorts of measurements forward uh, through the lifetime of the LHC, uh, you get the following sort of projections. Uh, what this plot is showing is uh, at least projections of what Atlas and CMS could do in terms of uh, finding evidence for the self coupling of the Higgs uh, normalized to the standard model value. So this kappa parameter of one is the standard model prediction. Um, and then this is just showing you some, some likelihood ratio. And what you should interpret from this plot is that by the end of the HL LHC, uh, we should be able to get about four sigma evidence for the production of pairs of Higgs bosons. And translating that into evidence for Higgs self interactions, we should be able to determine at better than two sigma significance that the Higgs is indeed self interacting, uh, assuming it has the properties of the standard model. So this is a question that we can answer during the lifetime of the LHC whether or not the Higgs is self-interacting. And if it in fact is self-interacting, even if it's the standard model prediction, 
that's a phenomenon that we have yet to see in nature. Uh, the self-interaction that doesn't change internal quantum numbers. There's a third thing, a third measurement or set of measurements that we are making and will continue to make at the LHC, which also will again, either confirm the standard model, but in doing so tell us something qualitatively new, or if they deviate from the standard model, be a sign again of new physics. Uh, and that set of measurements has to do with the existence of, in some sense, a new fundamental force, uh, a Yukawa force between fundamental particles. So in the standard model, of course, the Higgs couples to fermions in proportional to their masses. And that means the exchange of the Higgs mediates a Yukawa interaction between the fermions. So again, we've seen Yukawa forces in the strong interactions before, but not until the discovery of the Higgs uh, have we seen an apparent Yukawa force between fundamental particles. Now, the existence of this force we've now established at better than five sigma uh, by looking at uh, the coupling of the Higgs bosons to the heavy third generation fermions of the standard model. This has now been established in the LHC run two. And uh, the significance of this, I think, is summed up really nicely by this quote from Gavin Salam, uh, which is, you know, is this any less important than the discovery of the Higgs boson itself? My opinion, no, because fundamental interactions are as important as fundamental particles. So, you know, depending on what emphasis you place on the discovery of particles versus interactions, you may feel differently. But the measurement, uh, the discovery of a Yukawa force between fundamental particles is a profound thing and one that's only come in the last few years. But even though we've been able to measure uh, evidence for the Yukawa force mediated between heavy fermions of the standard model by the Higgs, uh, the question of whether this Yukawa force is also mediated between lighter fermions of the standard model, this is one for the future of the LHC, and one that is perhaps even more interesting than the establishment of a Yukawa force between third generation fermions. And the reason for that comes back to this sort of surprising property of the standard model that uh, not all, you know, first, the surprising property is that fermions are massive at all in the first place. But then the next surprising thing is that there is a hierarchy in their masses. And it's perhaps not surprising in the quantum field theory uh, that you know, there should be very heavy fermions coupled to the Higgs because they have couplings that are sort of order one. What's really surprising about the standard model is that there should be very light fermions. There should be fermions whose coupling to the Higgs are much smaller because that points to some underlying structure that differentiates between the generations. And so measuring the Yukawa force between lighter fermions in the standard model is in some sense, a more interesting probe of the flavor structure of the standard model than just measuring the coupling of the Higgs to third generation fermions. So this is a physics program, again, that will unfold over the next 18 years. Uh, and we expect to be able to establish the Higgs coupling to muons to very great significance. But we also even be able, expect to be able to establish to within about a factor of two of the standard model Higgs couplings to second generation fermions like the charm. These measurements alone are very interesting. So as I've tried to argue, measuring the Higgs self-coupling, even if it agrees with the standard model, is evidence of a new phenomenon that we have yet to see before in nature. And the same thing is true of measuring the Yukawa force mediated by the Higgs. But these things in combination are even more powerful. So once we have compelling measurements of the Higgs coupling to itself, as well as the Higgs coupling to the fermions of the standard model, we can now ask what happens uh, to the structure of the theory as we go to shorter and shorter distances. And in the standard model with the Higgs, something remarkable happens. Uh, in particular, if you take the properties of the standard model Higgs measured at the weak scale, and you uh, play them forward to shorter and shorter distances using the normalization group, you discover something interesting, which is that the Higgs self-coupling actually becomes negative as a function of scale. There's a very high scale, uh, well above the weak scale at which the coupling becomes negative. And if you interpret that from the perspective of the effective potential, that points uh, in some sense to the uh, a turnover in the potential or the effective potential of the Higgs, where right around the origin at low scales, you have the sort of roll away from the origin, this wine bottle potential we're used to thinking of from the Higgs. But the fact that the quartic turns negative at very high scales in the effective potential, that corresponds to the potential at large field values rolling over again and going to negative values. And so that would imply uh, that the standard model vacuum in which we live is no longer the stable minimum of the theory, but in fact that we are simply in a metastable vacuum. Um, so in some sense, you know, this is the fate of the universe because if we are in a metastable vacuum, eventually over enough time, there will be a tunneling event uh, in which we nucleate bubbles of the true vacuum that eventually could expand to fill out space time. 
Um, and so this question of uh, whether or not the standard model vacuum is in fact unstable or metastable, what is its lifetime? This has to do very intimately with the properties of the Higgs, its coupling to standard model fermions and its coupling to itself. Um, so there's a sharp prediction in the standard model, uh, given the Higgs we've seen at 125 GeV, that in fact, we're in a metastable vacuum with a lifetime that's about 10 to the 139 years. But exactly what the lifetime is uh, of the universe that we occupy depends sensitively on the outcomes of these measurements. And so although it might sound hyperbolic to say that the fate of the universe is really uh, at the hands of these Higgs measurements, in fact, it very much is. So to me, at least, these are really the central questions of the post-Higgs discovery era, right? Uh, is the Higgs an elementary or, or a composite particle? Does it interact with itself? Does it mediate a Yukawa force? And these are the central questions because the answers are interesting whether or not they agree with the standard model. If they agree with the standard model, it's not just a validation of a theory, but it's evidence for new phenomena that we have not yet observed. On the other hand, of course, if there are deviations from the standard model, then that is necessarily a sign of new physics. Uh, and we should expect to see additional degrees of freedom. Okay. But although these are the central questions, these are not the only questions that surround the Higgs. Uh, and I just wanna to touch on a couple more of the questions that surround the Higgs that we'll be able to probe in the coming 18 years of the LHC. To me at least, and as Tuhin advertised at the very beginning, the sort of central question that we can try to learn by continuing to study the Higgs is why is electric symmetry broken in the first place? And not only why is electric symmetry broken in the first place, but what sets the scale? So this is often referred to as the electric hierarchy problem. Uh, the hierarchy problem you know, is a sort of funny problem these days, I think, because some of the predictions uh, that were made from thinking about the hierarchy problem over the course of the last 30 years have not come to pass. I think a lot of people have questions about whether the hierarchy problem is a real thing at all. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time at least giving you my way of thinking about the hierarchy problem uh, and why I think it still is a very productive strategy uh, for searching for new physics and trying to understand the property of the Higgs. And uh, to do that, I actually wanna start with something that seems very remote or removed from the Higgs, but at the same time is hopefully very familiar to all of you, uh, no matter what your background is, um, because it's something that you actually encounter in some sense when you first learn uh, electromagnetism. Uh, you know, possibly in high school or as an undergraduate. And of course, back then, when you just learn about electromagnetism and electrons, uh, you come to recognize this very interesting puzzle, which is the self energy of, uh, of the electron uh, due to its own electromagnetic fields. That if you simply compute the energy stored in the fields uh, of an electron uh, in the classical theory, you find that that's a quantity that diverges as the radius of the electron is taken to zero. And uh, of course, in a relativistic context, uh, that self-energy you can think of as being a contribution to the rest mass. And so what you would conclude from that is that there is on one hand an observed mass or observed rest mass of, uh, of the electron, which you could think of as a sum of two different pieces, one coming from its self-energy and one coming from some unobserved bare contribution. Now, experimentally, you could go and look and find that you, know, you, you don't find any evidence for a radius of the electron down to something like 10 to the minus 18 centimeters. And so in the classical theory, that would tell you that the contribution to the rest mass from its self-energy is of order about 100 GeV uh, or greater. And if that's the case, then you would end up with an interesting puzzle. On one hand, uh, of course, the rest mass of the electron we observed to be 511 keV. But given this large self-energy, uh, which has to be at least 100 giga electron volts in the classical theory. The only way to reconcile the observed rest mass with the self energy is if the self energy is canceled off by this unobserved bare mass to very high precision. Now, that could well be. Uh, there's you know, nothing goes wrong in nature if that's what happens. But there is a way to get around that apparent fine tuning, which would be instead for the theory itself to change. Okay. So an alternative to this fine tuning would be uh, that there is instead a different length scale, different from the radius of the electron, at which the picture changes, at which the calculation changes. And uh, it would change in such a way as to possibly reconcile the observed mass of the electron uh, with the underlying predictions of the theory. Okay. So in this case, if you just looked at the, at the inputs, you would say, well, I could get away from some sort of fine tuning uh, if in fact the picture of classical electromagnetism changed on scales of about three times 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. 
So orders of magnitude longer length scales than the bound on the radius of the electron. But if the picture changed at those length scales, then I could avoid some sort of fine tuning. And of course, as we know, uh, as, as Dirac and Weisskopf taught us, this is exactly what happens in electromagnetism. So once you take the classical theory of electromagnetism and you promote it to a, a quantum theory, uh, you learn in some sense there's a new underlying symmetry of CPT. And that tells you that in addition to the electron, there's now a new degree of freedom, the antiparticle of the electron, the positron. And that positron, the existence now of the positron, it changes the vacuum structure of the theory. So now you can think of, you know, instead of thinking about the classical vacuum of electromagnetism, now in the quantum vacuum of electromagnetism, there are, for example, bubbles of positrons and electrons. And these change the structure of the theory precisely on the order of a few hundred times 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. And so the picture changes. And now in the new picture, where you don't just have the electron and its self energy, but you also have the positron, now there are contributions to the electron self-energy, uh, precisely as you would have predicted in the classical theory. But there's also countervailing contributions coming from, for example, diagrams where a positron enters. And when you add these two diagrams, and here for the aficionados, these are diagrams in old-fashioned perturbation theory. When you add these two diagrams, what you find is a cancellation of the leading self-energy contributions and a residual that's only logarithmically sensitive to the radius of the electron. So the puzzle, which is, how do you reconcile the apparently divergent uh, classical self-energy of the electron with the fact that its mass uh, you know, is, is much smaller than that apparent self-energy would suggest, is that in fact the picture changes. And the picture change is associated with the appearance of the new particle, the positron. And by calculating in the new more complete theory, you find that this sensitivity of the radius of the electron vanishes uh, up to some small logarithmic correction. Okay. So that's the story that we learn, right? When we first learn electromagnetism and have our first uh, exposure to quantum electrodynamics uh, is in some sense, the first manifestation and resolution of a hierarchy problem. And rather than calling it a problem, I, I like to call it a strategy. Uh, in particular, I like to call it the naturalness strategy. And so the naturalness strategy is just the following. Anytime you have some degree of freedom that has, uh, for example, a mass or a self energy, that appears to be sensitive to the radius or the size of that particle, there's one of two possibilities. One possibility is that in fact, there's a fine tuning that reconciles the self energy or the mass of the particle with its apparent sensitivity to the radius. But the other possibility is that the picture changes on some length scale that alters the original calculation and replaces it with something in which there is no fine tuning. And that plays out beautifully in just thinking about the electron resolved by the appearance of the positron. But that strategy uh, turns out to work again and again as you work, move up through the energy scales of the standard model. So every time as you go through the field content of the standard model, you encounter a fermion, it works in exactly the same way as the electron. But it also works in the same way, uh, not just for say the fermions, the, the leptons of the standard model, it also works for the scalars and pseudoscalars that we get uh, from bound states of, of uh, quantum chromodynamics. So for example, well before you hit the Higgs, uh, of course, as we've seen, you get things like the mesons of the strong interactions. And uh, you can consider, for example, uh, the charge and neutral pions. So the neutral, as, as we've discussed, the charge and neutral pions are, are pseudo Goldstone bosons, uh, but the charge pions couple to electromagnetism, whereas the neutral pion does not. And so there's now a contribution to the charge pion self energy coming from uh, their coupling to the photon where there is no such uh, contribution to the mass of the, or the self energy of the neutral pion. So you can repeat the same sort of calculation that you would do for the electron. And you could say, well, the charge pions have some sensitivity, uh, some self energy that's uh, proportional to the square, in fact, of their radius or the inverse square of their radius. And very naively, that would tell you that there is some fine tuning going on in the mass of the charge pion. But you can also go in nature and say, well, we measure the, the mass splitting between the charge and neutral pion. Uh, in terms of the squared masses, the difference is about 35.5 MeV squared. And so now you can ask the following question. Either there's some sort of underlying fine tuning in which the naively large contributions to the charge pion self energy are canceled, or the picture changes, and the picture changes at precisely the right scale to avoid a fine tuning. And so if you, apply that logic to the mass splitting between the charge and neutral pion, you predict that the picture change should happen before about 850 MeV. 
And lo and behold, as you move up through the mass spectrum of bound states of QCD, you in fact find the appearance of the Rho meson at 770 MeV. And that's really the harbinger of uh, the fact that the, the pions are themselves bound states of QCD. Okay. So again, applying the naturalness strategy to the mesons of the standard model, uh, again, is a great success. And it tells you that the picture changes in precisely the right place to avoid a fine tuning. Okay. So now when you come and encounter the Higgs again, the problem is not some sort of new problem. It's really just the recapitulation of something that we have seen again and again throughout the standard model that has always been resolved by the change of picture and the appearance of new degrees of freedom. And so the problem is exactly the same when we hit the Higgs, that if we assume that the Higgs is an elementary particle and the standard model is valid down to some length scale, then the self energy or the mass of the Higgs has some strong sensitivity to that length scale. And so if we simply apply the same naturalness strategy to the Higgs, that tells us to expect that the picture should change at some scale that's not that different from the weak scale. Okay. So this is maybe a different way of talking about the hierarchy problem than you normally hear, but it's one I think that's useful because uh, this is not some abstract theoretical problem. It's really just the repetition of the same sort of logic that we've seen again and again throughout the structure of the standard model. And so the Higgs is just interesting because it's the first time that we've seen the problem again and we haven't immediately seen what the resolution is. So the last 40 years, we've had a lot of time to think about this and uh, the sort of canonical candidates that arose uh, to address the hierarchy problem or the naturalness strategy proposed by the Higgs were really things that worked in analogy with what we'd already seen in the standard model. So uh, one possibility is you know, to think that maybe the Higgs itself is just like a pion, that there's instead at the energy scale uh, suggested by the naturalness strategy, some new degrees of freedom show up to give us evidence that the Higgs is in fact the bound state. Uh, and so that works very well. That's a, a beautiful set of strategies known as compositeness of the Higgs um, that predict an abundance of new physics around the TEV scale. The other possibility is uh, that the problem is resolved much like it is for the electron. So in the case of the electron, of course, what solved the problem was the appearance of the positron and that pointed to an underlying chiral symmetry of the fermions. So that logic can't be applied directly to the Higgs, but if there's a symmetry that relates the Higgs as a scalar to a fermion, then the Higgs can piggyback on the symmetry structure of the fermion to again uh, solve the problem. And so that's all that supersymmetry does. Supersymmetry just relates the Higgs as a scalar to a fermion and then uses the same sort of resolution for the fermion as worked for the, uh, the electron to understand how the picture changes. Now, both of these classes of ideas, you know, they predict a plethora of new particles that interact with the standard model. And uh, these degrees of freedom should be appearing you know, at a few hundred GeV or at the TeV scale. And so one of the things that we've learned over the last nine years since the discovery of the Higgs is that at least as far as we can tell, the degrees of freedom predicted by these solutions to the hierarchy problem don't appear to exist below a tera electron volt. So they're not there as we expected they would be before we started operating the LHC. And there's a couple of possibilities that we could extract from this. Uh, one of them is that this entire strategy is just misguided. And that's a perfectly reasonable conclusion to draw. To me, it's very premature because again, the hierarchy problem is not some new abstract problem. It's just the repetition of the same logic that is applied again and again throughout every step uh, in energy of the standard model. And so there's really no reason to expect that it should completely fall apart when we get to the Higgs. The second possibility is that these ideas that work in analogy with other parts of the standard model still apply. And we just have yet to see them. And we just have to keep looking, going up higher and higher in energy. That's also very interesting, but there's just not much more we could learn from it. The third uh, possibility, short, yeah. A short question, is the neutral naturalness also ruled out below one TV? Yeah, no, so, so let, me, let me briefly, and I apologize, I'm going to give it the colloquium level degree of treatment. There's a third possibility that Tuhin anticipated, which is that maybe what the natural strategy is telling us in the case of the Higgs is that the problem is still solved, the picture still changes, but the physics associated with that change in picture is not like what we've seen, for example, elsewhere in the standard model, but is instead something somewhat different. Uh, and as a result, it gives us signatures that we weren't expecting to look for. So one of the things that's happened over the course of the last five or six years is really an explosion in theory work uh, designed to understand 
what other ways you could solve this hierarchy problem that would have signatures that wouldn't have obviously shown up already at the LHC. And there's quite a few different examples. Uh, one of them is Tuhin just asked, um, is the idea of neutral naturalness. And this idea is uh, instead of predicting that there is a, a symmetry that solves the hierarchy problem uh, with an abundance of new particles charged into the standard model, it's possible that it could still be solved by symmetry, but a sort of much lighter symmetry. One that instead of predicting new particles charged into the standard model, predicts new particles charged instead, for example, under some completely different set of interactions. And this is compelling because it can still address the hierarchy problem, but it doesn't necessarily give a super abundance of signatures at the LHC. Uh, so this paradigm goes under the name of neutral naturalness. And per Tugin's question, uh, no, this hasn't been ruled out to the TEV scale yet. So this is a much more viable explanation or solution to the naturalness strategy uh, than, than supersymmetry compositeness. But it's one that will be systematically tested as we continue to play forward at the LHC. Uh, there's other possibilities. There's something called a relaxion. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the details of this. But that's just to say, uh, what I think we learned from data uh, is that to the extent that this problem remains interesting, there's simply new directions to push on. There's something, you know, whether or not you think the, the hierarchy problem is a compelling reason to look for new physics uh, in association with the Higgs, there's also just very strong reason to continue to inspect the Higgs uh, in connection with a very robust failure of the standard model which is the existence of dark matter. So of course, you know, dark matter we know is there, the coincidence, approximate coincidence of the baryonic energy density and, and non-baryonic non energy density suggests that dark matter has some interactions with the standard model beyond gravitation. So the simplest possibility, of course, is that the dark matter is some weak scale particle with some weak coupling that explains this dark matter abundance. And the Higgs, for many reasons, is a natural mediator uh, between the dark matter and the standard model. And a very sharp signature of that, if the Higgs in fact is what interpolates between dark matter and the standard model, is that if dark matter is light enough, then uh, every once in a while when you produce the Higgs, the Higgs can decay into dark matter. And this is something that we can get at. Of course, we have many different searches for dark matter, but if in fact the Higgs couples to dark matter and dark matter is light enough, then you can look for it by looking for invisible decays of the Higgs. And these invisible decays are something that currently we have somewhat good sensitivity to at the LHC, but that sensitivity will only get better and better uh, over the course of the next 18 years. All right. Um, so I know I'm reaching time. I just want to, that's sort of brings me to some of the things that we can learn uh, in the remaining lifetime of the LHC. I now just want to look uh, a little bit beyond uh, what might succeed the LHC um, to the extent that the Higgs, I think has pointed us to many, many questions. Some of them can be answered with satisfaction at the LHC, uh, but some of them require uh, probing the theory of the standard model, the structure of the standard model at higher and higher energies, and more and more precision. And so since the discovery of the Higgs, uh, there's really been an explosion uh, of exploration of possible colliders that might come after the Higgs that would really at the end of the day leverage, uh, excuse me, that would come after the LHC that would leverage uh, the power of the Higgs to, to shed light uh, on, on physics beyond the standard model. Um, and so many of these candidates uh, came together in a very sharp way to make their physics case uh, for the European strategy for particle physics update, which happened in 2019 and 2020. Uh, there are a variety of candidates at this point. There are linear electron positron colliders like the ILC and CLIC, as well as circular electron positron colliders like the CEPC in China or FCCEE at CERN, uh, as well as 100 TeV or higher energy proton proton machines. And so the question really has been, um, what can these sorts of colliders after the LHC, you know, what can they offer in terms of helping us to understand uh, the physics of the standard model and to address the questions that I raised earlier in the talk. So maybe in the interest of time, I'll skip to the time scales. Uh, but the message from all of the exploration is uh, that colliders that would succeed the LHC, whether they be electron positron colliders or higher energy proton proton machines, among other things, uh, they can offer precision in Higgs couplings that is more than an order of magnitude better than what we expect to get by the end of the lifetime of the LHC. And so to the extent that the LHC can help us to make progress in answering questions about uh, whether the Higgs is fundamental or composite, whether it's self-interacting, whether it mediates Yukawa force, the ultimate answers to those questions lie in the sensitivity that we can get from Higgs factories that would succeed the LHC. And so the process of figuring out exactly which collider it is that is the optimal success of the LHC and what we stand to learn from it uh, is very much an ongoing one. 
but I think it points to the vibrancy of these questions uh, and the sense in which they shape the future of the field. I think in the interest of time, I will skip over some of the details of why I think that's interesting. And maybe I'll just bring it to this last bit, which is that um, a lot of the exploration of these colliders that would succeed the LHC has very much proceeded in analogy with the colliders that have come before the LHC. So in particular, a lot of the dialogue has centered around linear or circular electron-positron colliders or circular proton-proton machines operating at higher energies. But there's another possibility, uh, and it's one that wasn't seriously considered in the European strategy update, uh, but is being very seriously considered in the wake of that strategy update. And that's the possibility that the collider that comes after the LHC could be one in which we collide uh, muons and anti-muons together rather than electrons and positrons. There are abundant reasons for doing so. Uh, among other things, the fact that the muon is so much heavier than the electron means that the energy losses to synchrotron radiation are vastly reduced. And so you can get much higher energy uh, mu plus mu minus collisions uh, in the same accelerator footprint than you could get with electrons and positrons. But at the same time, because muons are elementary particles, uh, you're able to extract all of the energy of the muons in their collision. This is in contrast with colliding protons together where you typically only get a small fraction of the protons uh, in some interesting hard process during a collision. So a muon collider, even operating at the same center of mass energies as the LHC would effectively be able to probe energy scales more than an order of magnitude beyond the LHC. So this combination of energy, uh, which is accessible from colliding muons, and also precision, because again, as elementary particles, they don't produce huge, very complicated, strongly interacting final states, could position a, a muon collider uh, as a natural successor to the LHC, giving us both great precision in Higgs measurements and also great power in probing new energy. So uh, actually just this Monday or, or last night, uh, we put out on the archive a physics case for uh, a muon colliders of various energies from a TeV to 100 TeV, trying to understand the sense in which this could be a natural successor to the LHC. So if you're curious, I encourage you to go take a look. Uh, I expect that exploring the physics of a muon collider will be something that the, the field is very interested in in the coming decade. Right. So that brings me to the end. Um, as I hoped to have uh, introduced at the beginning, I think you know, the Higgs discovery really marks the completion of the standard model in a very exciting way. But at the end of the day, it, it raises more questions than it answers. And a lot of these are questions where uh, no matter whether they are agreement with the standard model or evidence of the, the departure from the standard model, the measurements that we can make are interesting, whether the Higgs has a size, whether it has a self-interaction, the hierarchy problem, uh, the nature of dark matter, these questions really are going to animate the next 18 years or 20 years of LHC physics. But at the end of the day, they also really point to the design and construction of a collider or the next generation of colliders to succeed the LHC. Uh, and at this point, we are now firmly in the planning stage for those colliders. And so uh, the next few years will be very interesting to see what path we choose to take in pursuing the physics of the Higgs further. Thanks very much for your time. I'm sorry for going a little bit over. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thanks, Nathaniel. Uh, so, uh, for a wonderful talk, uh, I think it was exactly at the right level of colloquium, as I think everyone gained a lot. So, I think we can have some questions now. Yeah, TP has a question. TP, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for a really nice talk. You know, I'm an outsider, so I got educated. Thank you. So my question is related to its mechanism of the electroweak symmetry breaking. And there's one idea around uh, that uh, spontaneously broken symmetries like the electroweak one uh, are mediated by a quantum to classical transition. What I mean by that is that the electroweak symmetry breaking is perhaps also the quantum gravity scale. So prior to the rest of when the electroweak symmetry is restored, gravity also becomes a quantum. We have a, now a quantum gravitational space time with all the uh, forces unified. And gravity is mediated not by gravitons, but by spin one gravity bosons, which are on par with the other standard model gauge bosons. So, sorry, my question is very vague. Do you have some ideas about how one can test this? 
that the electrovic scale is also the quantum gravity scale. Um, good, good. I, I, mean, I think the, the, to me at the end of the day, the, this sort of question, um, the answer always lies in the power of effective field theory, right? That if indeed, mm -hmm. let's say the, the physics of electric symmetry breaking is tied up in the physics of quantum gravity, what you would expect from that very generally uh, is not just the structure of interactions of the standard model, but a whole host of these irrelevant operators, right? So I, I sort of gave you this uh, sketch of this tower of irrelevant operators. Let me see if I can find the slide here, um, which mm. you know, are just are higher powers of standard model fields suppressed by some scale. And so at mm. the end of the day, although the details you know, of, of the physics may vary depending on your model, if indeed the physics of quantum gravity uh, is responsible for the electroweak scale, and particularly if they coincide, then what you really expect is a whole host of these irrelevant operators, and they should mm -hmm. all be particularly important. Um, and so I think, you know, very broadly, right, what I would say is, if you would like to find evidence that, that something like quantum gravity is responsible for the generation of the electroweak scale, you should really be very interested in looking for evidence of these irrelevant operators. And mm -hmm. these irrelevant operators show up in patterns of deviations from standard model predictions. Mm -hmm. okay. Without knowing more about the specific scenario you have in mind, I can't be more detailed. No. But uh, well, for example, oh. one prediction is that uh, um, and like something like violation of lepton universality, the three generations are not exactly the same. So, uh, yeah, that's the kind of signature. Indeed, and it depends a little bit on whether you mean um, lepton flavor universality violation or or lepton flavor violation. Uh, Obviously, those are slightly different things, but in both yeah. cases, indeed, those those can be interpreted, assuming that the scale of physics is slightly above the scale of the Higgs itself, can always be interpreted mm -hmm. in the form of irrelevant operators. And so, then, indeed, you would be okay. very interested in patterns of these okay. irrelevant operators. Okay, more specific pattern. Okay. You know, okay. your given theory, of course, has a specific pattern of these operators. Um, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, from the bottom up, I would simply be interested in looking for evidence of the irrelevant operators. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. So this is the language to try to develop if one is coming from a, a sort of bottom-up theory, uh, pre-quantum, pre-space time theory. So find out what are the irrelevant operators. Yes, uh, indeed. Your your theory should always pass over to some effective field theory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where the the theory the space time looks approximately smooth and the mm -hmm. field theory looks approximately like the standard model and mm -hmm. the fingerprints of your underlying theory will be irrelevant operators correcting the standard model. And they will come with a scale, which is presumably associated with the scale at which you have interesting space-time physics. So to me, that's that's always uh, the right way to, to think about the imprints on standard model properties. Thank you. Okay, Atuhin, go ahead. Uh, I think Nishita raised third hand before. Okay, Nishida. Uh, yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. And I particularly enjoyed the way you reframed a lot of old questions in new language. Uh, I just had a very general question. Uh, when you say that uh, the scale of new physics that is expected by these, um, the, the same arguments that you gave for, for example, for compositeness is about 500 GV. I was wondering what is the leeway on this? Can this be 5,000 or is it just 500 plus or minus? So good, so, so good. So, so exactly what the scale is comes from the expectation that the change in picture should happen at precisely the point that the fine tuning would start to appear. So, and the reason for that expectation is again, as I'd like to frame it, it's an analogy with what happens elsewhere in the standard model. So in particular, everywhere else in the standard model, the picture change happens either right at the scale that it needs to, to avoid fine tuning, or a little bit before. So you know, in the example of, let's say the appearance of the positron, right? The change of picture that, that uh, allows you to understand the electron self energy, the change of scale to avoid fine tuning needed to happen at three times 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. And instead it happens uh, two orders of magnitude before then in terms of longer length scale. Okay, so there the picture changes well before it has to. If you look at the, the charge neutral mass splitting, charge neutral pi on mass splitting, there, you know, if you say the picture should change right at the point that you would start to have fine tuning, 
you would say, I expect new physics at 850 MeV, and you see it at 770 MeV. So you see it right, right on time. And the same is true for the K-long, K-short mass difference being explained by the mass of the charm. So when I say 500 GeV is the scale you expect, that comes from applying the literal same logic that the picture change should happen exactly where the fine tuning begins to emerge. But you know, this is the this is the place where now you can decide, you know, how much how much um, faith do you put in the previous examples? And if it, if we're off by a factor of two or a factor of four, that that probably doesn't mean that the idea the strategy is failing. Uh, but that would indeed change the energy scale. So at the end of the day, we don't know how nature computes fine tuning, right? So the best we can do is work an analogy with what we've seen. And by that analogy, you would expect 500 GeV, but there's nothing cast in stone. And so if it turns out to be a TeV or two TeV, that's still qualitatively in the same picture. Right, I was just trying to gauge uh whether our current experiments are indeed uh, capable of probing this whole uh, interesting region, or we definitely right. have missed it. Because I mean, run to a LHC has collected most of data. So if we had, if we were to see something, we would see two sigma, three sigma by now already. Well, and I guess I there's there's maybe maybe let me take two different answers to your question. So so one, I would I would actually. I would revisit the, we, we do sort of have this idea that the LHC has seen, if we're gonna see something, we would see evidence of it by now. Now it's true that we're not gonna make any more big leaps in energy at the LHC, but we've only collected 6% of the data, right? That we're going to collect at the LHC. And so, you know, that's, that's, a, that's more than an order of magnitude of data remaining ahead of us. And there are many cases where if you just sit down and ask if we're going to discover something would we have seen evidence by now? And there are many cases where the answer is no. There's something where we could have seen nothing, but by the end of the LHC, we will discover something. Okay, that's just an aside that I think it's too early to say that whether or not the LHC could see something or not, right? There, there's much more room for that. But there is this question, as, as you put quite well, um, what energy do you need to go to to be satisfied that you've covered the interesting range? And again, you know, I really like to use historical precedent. And the historical precedent is usually that you need to sort of sweep to an order of magnitude above the energy scale of relevance to really understand it, right? That's certainly true of QCD, that you needed to go to sort of five or 10 GeV, uh, well above the scale of confinement to really understand the physics of confinement. And so the same thing, I think there's a strong argument as well for the physics of the weak scale, that it's not enough just to get to the weak scale that what you'd really like to do is sweep to an order of magnitude above it, um, because that really does give you the best qualitative sense of what could be going on. And I think that's a real motivation for something like a muon collider or a higher energy proton-proton machine that would push well above the weak scale. Um, okay, thank you. Two in. Yeah, okay. Um, so, First question is sort of political. Is uh, since you spent so much time on the muon collider, uh, what what do you think? Uh, I mean, what is the um, immediate future of the muon collider in in your own mind? Um, yeah. So so there's <laughs> uh, since you said it was political, I'll give you a partially political answer. One of the reasons for my interest, I mean, there's a physics reason, there are several physics reasons to be interested in a muon collider. I think this idea that that, it, that you don't have a trade-off between precision and energy, that you can get both of them by building a muon collider. So that's in a sense in which there is one collider that could do all of the things that you would want a future collider to do, which in all other proposals require two colliders. Okay. So that's there's there's just a solid physics reason. There's another reason which is political for me, which is that um, you know, the United States is not going to build an E plus E minus Higgs factory or a 100 TV proton proton machine, but you could fit a 10 TV muon collider on the Fermilab campus. And um, to me, that's, you know, there's a, there's a possibility of, of getting the US back into the energy frontier. Um, and that's a very interesting reason to think about it. Now, of course, that's very futuristic, right? So right now we have no muon colliders and so getting from no muon colliders to a 10 TV muon collider has a long path, but that path is very interesting. So 
you know, the first thing you would do, right, is you would, you would in some sense build a neutrino factory um, because you would need to get sufficiently high intensity beams uh, that you would eventually use as your muon source. Uh, you could do a great deal of neutrino physics with that that would build on the existing physics program in the United States. Uh, then you could imagine building, you know, running a muon collider at say 125 GeV. And so you could directly probe the Higgs uh, on, on resonance. Uh, with a lower energy muon collider with maybe less integrated luminosity. And without proof of principle, then you could go to higher energies. So the details of how exactly you could go from 125 GeV muon collider to a 10 GeV muon collider, that's more complicated. But I think there is an interesting set of intermediate steps which have a very rich physics program that touches sort of on all the different aspects of the standard model that are interesting right now. Um, and so I think that's another reason that makes the muon collider very compelling. And I think a final reason to be interested in it relative to the other possibilities is that, you know, if you're an experimentalist, right, you want to do something challenging. And, you know, building a slightly larger version of LEP or a slightly larger version of the LHC, while it does have technical challenges, is a sort of natural extension of the existing accelerator program. But, you know, the, the developments necessary for muon acceleration and cooling those are very interesting. And the detectors that you have to build to get interesting physics measurements with those beam induced backgrounds, those are very interesting. So I think also the technical challenges of muon collider in some sense, right? They, they give you know, ambitious experimentalists and accelerator physicists something really compelling to do. And, and I think that's any collider that comes after the LHC has to excite the entire community, right? <laughs> uh, in order for it to happen. So that's something that's interesting about a muon collider. Yeah, wonderfully put. Uh, I, I have one physics question. Sure. So um, what I guessed from your talk is in your mind is that um, compositeness or, uh, you know, or elementary, some way, uh, the distinction is whether it's uh, Higgs is a PNGV or not. Um, that, that was my impression of how it came across to me. Yeah, well, well, because in particular, you know, this this Compton wavelength versus the form factor yeah, radius, it, we, we it, already know there's a factor of four. So yeah. if it, it cannot be a completely composite state, right? Yeah. And so it is some sort of PNGV if yeah. it is composite. If it is any any. So now the, I mean, the this is where the question becomes slightly uh, hard to answer because you could also have, um, uh, it could also have an effective field theory. Um, uh, of Higgs, where Higgs is completely elementary. So you'd have higher dimension operator, but Higgs is completely elementary. You know, you be, it's like SMEFT versus HEFT problem, right? And so decide on that fact, whether it's a PNGV or it's a non-PNGV. Uh, I mean, it's it's the, it's an extra order question that goes beyond, you know, finding the uh, effect of a higher dimensional operator, right? Oh, so. of course, but, but, but I mean, let me put it to you this way. The moment you find any evidence for a, for, a, for a, a form factor operator, right? I mean, it, indeed, these are, as you say correctly, these operators could exist whether or not the Higgs is elementary. But the moment you find any evidence for such an operator, it has a scale attached to it, right? Yes. The scale you can infer, okay, by you measure the, you measure differential distribution so that you know what the order of the operators are and you know the scale. And so then of course you just, you go to that scale, right? I mean, <laughs> you, you, you build a collider, capable of reaching that scale. And at that point, okay, whether it's composite uh, or elementary, you can unravel what the physics is. The yeah. reason I framed the argument as I did, right, is what if you never see evidence for a form factor, right? What, what, if, what if you only ever set bounds? And thinking about it, at least making the argument as I've tried to make it, the null result becomes interesting, right? because it's telling you that the Higgs is the most elementary thing we have ever seen. So a null result, as you say, a positive result is ambiguous, but look, who cares? You've discovered new physics, cool. right? A null yeah. result is unambiguous, but framing it in this language makes it interesting. Okay. So maybe you would call that political as well, but. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I, I 
th I appreciate I've gone quite a bit over and, and uh, it's, uh, I'm happy to take any more questions you might have, but uh, I also, thanks, thanks so much for the time. Right. Doesn't look like we have any more question. Um, thanks a lot, Nick, for, uh, for the talk. It, again, it was, uh, it, it was really good that you, uh, you accepted this late, late, late <laughs> invite. Oh, of course. Th thanks for having me and, and given all the complications of remote talks, of course, I would much more look forward to, to continuing this conversation in person after, yeah. uh, after we get COVID all sorted out. So. Yeah, hopefully we'll be thanks happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks a lot. Great, thanks very much. Thanks, Take care. Thanks a lot.